Shut up, Legend. I'm a Legend, yeah. Shut up, like that. Um, we've been looking at your stuff for, for years, uh, a decade, I think, um, since 300 years. We, <laughs> I don't think, I think uh, 300 pretty much opened the door for us in terms of uh, the stylized uh, imagery coming from comics. Um, right the motion pictures, and I think they did it right. I was wondering, were you happy with 300 million of the film? I said it, yeah, directly right now. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Um, very happy. Yeah, I loved working on that movie. It was a thrill and an adventure and education and that. Awesome. Um, and then we went on to the I do believe, and uh, we had a pretty similar and, and, and pretty exciting. Um, of course, you like that too. Sure. Again, again. <laughs> no, at least with Tom and Tom and Tia and with my other friend, no means <laughs> book. So, page by page. And that's what happens when you have uh, artistic authority on things that are on the screen. You get to approve and disapprove, and, and, and we're happy with what we've seen uh, on the screen. Mostly, it's working for people who. Wait, wait, there's a whole trick, especially when you look in a, um, in a media that's intensely collaborative as film. You surround yourself with people who are better at, at, at their job than you could ever be. And, and, and so you, you, you tell them where you want to go and they should get there. Awesome. And then we go on to Batman. And you're uh, basically you're re imaging of Batman uh, pretty much as a, you know, a, a, a a better half of a bad ass, I guess is probably how I can, can, can do it. Uh, what are your thoughts towards how you develop that? Oh, it's when I got a hold of Batman, um, I mainly just wanted to, uh, to one thing, update it, because it seemed to be needed, but also make them uh, apply to something that resembles the world I live in. Batman seems to be trapped forever. In the old 1960s TV show, which happened in a very benevolent world, um, which hardly needed a guy to dress it up like a flying road and beat criminals up. Um, and since I, I was living in Manhattan, all I had to do was take a walk around on my block to see where we might need a guy who dressed up like a bat and clean the streets. And from that, I found that all the mythology of Batman started rolling back in. The kid's sidekick, the Batmobile, the cave, all of that. It did like that again because it was so well in the first place. It's, it's, a, it's a terrific mythology that doesn't survive for so long. And that's why Lunacy and Pugels can keep revisiting it again. I think it, I, your development on that, I think, pretty much spot out how we feel, pretty much uh, embody the way we would like to attack crime if we, in fact, were our own superheroes. It was, it, was, it was more realistic. You know, maybe uh, in the 1940s or things of that nature, or, or maybe reminiscent of that. What do you think? Well, it certainly had more to do with more to do with reality that I could see it and so on. You know, it wasn't mainly it wasn't here for quite so young an audience, um, and and uh, it, it didn't have much more to do with temporary comments. Um, so it wasn't one of the but along the way, I, I felt I didn't want to lose all the toys. I didn't want to lose the magical stuff that was Batman. The utility belt had to be there. The Batman had to be there. There had to be a rod. Turns out he didn't work it out. And even the Batman, all of that stuff came right back in because it's good stuff and it belongs to him. And as Brian, your collaboration with Frank was, you know, written to be. You can see uh, a little bit of your work that's been involved, of course, with Batman 3 coming out. Uh, is there anything that you can share with us that we should look out for coming out? Yeah. Are going to start with the Dark Knight 3? Yes. Is this is coming out this month? Yeah. This month? Yeah. You know, I promised you some holy shit moments in this area. <laughs> There's a couple of those issues. There's the last page that you can really do. You can wet yourself. It's getting good at it. Go ahead and open up some questions here. How you doing, Dr. Good. 
name is Matthew Colbertson, and I had a question about All Star Batman and Robin. The series, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed it very much, but in general, the series did not do very well. I am wondering why that was. Some would say because Batman was a little too violent, especially for the, um, but, great, and, or another reason was because of issue 10 use of uncensored profanity. What would you say to that? I can't ever predict how the audience is going to react. Um, and it could have been any of um, It was the book I did at the time that that thing to do. Um, some things I do differently now. Um, but um, mainly when you play with your toys, um, you can just see them in a sudden different directions. Especially if Brian is going to test and you're given freedom, the first thing you want to do is run with him. Then you pull yourself back and, and see where your experience comes So, lesson learned. Would you say you have made Batman back in the middle of too violent and cruel? The man dresses up like a bat because he beats up criminals. <laughs> The, the wonderful thing about a character like that, and any of that, is that he's open to wildly different interpretations. The, and, and I'm not an interpretator for surprise. I actually have um, in my home a Batman comic I picked up in Japan where he didn't take a quick look on the script. Um, and and uh, as the audience has gotten older and, and the boundaries have been tested, Further, we've done more with the established characters than we have in the past. Since I've now got the freedom to create and write and draw my own material, I'm more likely to get more conservative with the established characters than I have in the past. Because if I do some ditty, I can do whatever I want to. Um, but I still like the first thing. No good Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Uh, big thing. Uh, and um, you've only worked with a bunch of artists for certain years. And I was wondering, who's your favorite artist and why? <laughs> Careful. <laughs> Name a dead guy. <laughs> I'm a favorite kid in the next question. Thanks for asking. Hi, hi. Ask that same question. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, my name is Nicholas Hello, Nicholas. And I was wondering, who's your favorite character to draw and draw? Favorite character to draw? Oh, boy. To draw? I'd say Batman. He's big and scary, and he's a good guy. Thank you. Hello. Uh, big fan, especially along with Batman all the years. Uh, I always wanted to ask, uh, you're writing a little cinematic, it was one of the movies. Uh, how do you start uh, the play today to uh, play a full fledged story? Like, do you like plan it out and how do you do it? Well, I usually, everything starts from an idea, too. Um, and then some scribbles go. He can sit around for a month. Um, and then uh, speaking to or, or you know, the polite with each other. It's a very slow process. Um, but sooner or later, they just come together and start talking, and I start trying to turn it into a story. 
And then it's a matter of creating a problem and trying to solve it. In the case of revisiting a character like Batman or Superman, it's looking at what existed before and trying to become the essence of what the character is. And trying to explore that. In the case of something that's brand new, like my own city work, um, that involves creating a crime story. The, the, you know, which means creating a crime and working around that. But it's different each time. Usually I say a good rule of thumb is I start with the character and then put him in a, in a situation that defines who he is, which means he's got a problem to solve. And that way we really learn what he can happen. Thank you. In terms of 300, though, uh, I'm assuming since there is some, uh, I want to say, historical research, at least research that you needed to do uh, for 300, uh, where did you start from on that story? Well, with 300, my experience was started when I was seven years old, and I saw a movie called 300 Park, which is a country old movie um, starring Richard Egan. Would tell the story, told the story of the Spartans. And it inspired me for a long time. I, I started to research it, and, and uh, it was always cooking around as you know, I got into the comics and became a professional. I seen the story I knew and I thought I was ready. And at about the time I hit like 29 years old or something, I realized I better start getting to work on this thing because, because I was putting it off. So I started reading about it, and everything else there was on, on the legend, and getting all the, um, the physical research I could. And so I just dove in and started, started drawing on it. And uh, it was really the thing. Um, I had a crazy publisher, Dark Horse Comics, who was willing to take a chance doing a historical um, war story. It was unheard of at the time when other people ever did work were guys in time. Um, and, and but Dark Horse was loaded back at full force and including a book tour and all of that and, and we, we got it done and luckily you all liked it. It's awesome. Hello. Hi, my name is Tristan and I was wondering, was there ever a moment when you were creating the Dark Knight Return and you were like, wow, this is gonna change the comics forever? Thanks, Tristan. Um, no. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I mean, my, the main big thought that kept it me was there's never going to publish this. <laughs> well, they did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello there. Hey. Uh, I wanted to ask a Sin City question. In the Sin City comics on the letter pages, something about a World War II style Sin City story. And I was wondering if, if it was possible if you were ever going to get to that or so I explain to you exactly a story like that. Real life it's called the Homefront. And it involves uh, two T characters up against the Nazi boot, which was the Nazi party in America, which was much stronger than many of you have ever known to believe. Um, America was very close to the fascist. And uh, it was a little like the one at the time. And that's exactly the admiral on your spot. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Hello there. Hello. Uh, I'm Michael Roberts. I'm a serial friend. I'm a huge fan. I love everything that you've worked on. It's awesome. Uh, my question is uh, on, uh, well, on Batman vs. Superman, you sort of saw a change in Batman's role on killing. I was wondering if, like, if you're, if you're Batman, you continue, like, doing, like, if the story was supposed to take like, a move on, would you ever believe that you're Batman and start killing as well? Or would you believe that you say that you choose to mourn that you're Batman? Well, I wouldn't take that in terms of from a movie for my version of Batman. They take our therapy from us. Um, but the, the, uh, Okay. But, um, no, I feel like my feeling is, is that Batman has had an imperative against murder because he's been a victim of it. He lost his parents right before his eyes. He doesn't regard himself as a judge of life, as a judge of life and death. So he was never murdered. 
say, I love Sam City, I really want to do it. And I said, that this, 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 you seem like a really nice guy, I'll not waste your time. And he says, well, can we meet him at dinner anyway? And I got a call from a friend who called me up and said, I heard you heard from Robert Rodriguez, you idiot. And I said, what do you mean? He said, this guy is really important. He knows exactly what he's doing. You're making a fool of yourself. So I went and had Robert Rodriguez because he was for real. Um, a friendship began. And a, a, I was on this miraculous adventure in Texas with the man as he showed me filmmaking from head to toe. He involved me in every step of the process along the way. Very early on, he you know, he he, he said, you know, you got to direct it with me and, and show me how to work with actors. And we shot the whole thing and, and uh, I ended it with him and ended up with a pretty nifty movie of it. It's a clinic and a half year process. Great. Yeah. One of the best dads i
in occupied France, Superman shot down of, um, over France, lands in a small village, and nursed back to help fight. French resistance people, and he, he must be powered, and he's up against uh, a Nazi Panzer tank, which he in the village. Is that the answer? Oh, I can start tomorrow, if he says yes. Yeah, hello! <laughs> Give away about that. Well, Superman. I grew up uh, watching 
uh, Max and Dave Fleischer, Superman cartoonist. And Superman was my first superhero. Um, and I adore Superman. Like, I, just, I just love the character of that. Uh, people might think otherwise, because I, when I see the dark side, I was doing a Batman story. And Batman is not particularly fond of Superman. And, and I, the whole story was from Batman's point of view. And one thing I always wanted to believe was, anyway, because it's a fan, was I wanted to see Batman kick up the guitar on a superhero. So I got, I got to write a song now, and that was a kick. And then when I do a superhero story, you'll see a different perspective. It's very insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hi. Hi, Frank. Um, my name is Frank Morris. My question is, in your creative process, when taking the reins of iconic characters like Daredevil or Batman, any existing character has a certain mythos about it. How do you balance your gritty style with still including some of the escapism and even though it may not be a lot of there, a certain bit of joy uh, in, in the stories? You is, I think that stuff's pretty joyful. <laughs> I'm laughing a lot when I'm doing it. Uh, I love the fact that these guys can fly. I wish I could. <coughs> uh, the, the, uh, but, uh, so I think it's big to see like this people dressed up in tight. So I might grab them off the but too, that it is the big to see. So, so and, and along the way I wanted to bring a tether to reality. But if I, if I try to do we always seem pretty. Just, just reality has, has fun texture, but um, but but I, I try to tether it more to reality, so it feels like like something is happening in the world we inhabit. Remember the when they did the first Superman movie, the slogan was "You'll believe a man can fly," and they spent nearly half the movie before he ever lifted off the ground because they were building up to the moment where they got us used to the idea that he could fly. I feel that a big part of the job of writing and doing comic books about these guys in tights who do amazing things is reintroducing the entire notion of if it were brand new, because for some people it will be brand new and let them learn about it. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, I have a question. My name is Elise, and as long as I can remember, I've always been a Batman fan. And I've never seen a fat man like yours in my life. Oh, I hope you mean that in a good way. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so can you name one of your most inspirational moments in your life? What kind? Teacher, he's a foreign teacher and a purely communicator. 
And so, yeah, that's 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 good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, how about you, Brian? Do you have uh, uh, an inspirational moment that you could probably recall? Anyone kind of speak a little less likely about you or kind of 
kind of got to me. So I think Brett Morrison, if I remember, he was passing the rest of the country to you, and I wanted to, and I wanted to ask, what are your thoughts on Brett Morrison? I don't know. Well, we well, never read it. Uh, well, that was my only question. You used too many words. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Frank, for your question. Good. Uh, before we go ahead and get the panel, uh, Brian and uh, Frank here, obviously, is there anything you can share with the audience about what you have coming up? You've already, I guess, kind of revealed and teased us a little bit. Things that you're working on that's going to be released soon. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Teeth us even higher. Uh, <laughs> I think you teach pretty well. And this is five coming out. Uh, six is going to uh, up to five. Uh, <laughs> the next one we have next is going to up to five by one. How <laughs> sad is it? <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, Hispanic Book House is proud to present to you Brian Azzarello and Mr. Frank Miller.